to behave like an oil economy. And I'll explain why. There are 180 million of us. We have 2 million barrels of oil a day. The Kuwaitis have 3.9 million people and 3 million barrels of oil a day. So we can't afford to behave like an oil economy. And what is an oil economy? An oil economy simply pumps the oil up and then they use the money, the dollars, to buy everything they need. That's the economic model, model that Nigeria at large needs. That's what we've been doing. We don't add value. We don't get any of the byproducts. They just give us the dollars and then we import everything. And what does that do? It means that Nigeria has become a very unproductive economy. The states come. I was a commissioner. Every month, all of us, 36, fly up to Abuja and we share. That's, that's the constitution. But that was not the intention of the Nigerian dream. The Nigerian dream was 36 states all producing, all productive. Now, what did oil do for us? It made us extremely lazy. It made so many businesses unpro un unprofitable. And in particular, because of the way we spent our oil proceeds. And I shall speak to that in, in, as we go on. Because the truth is, what we spent money on was the, were the wrong things. And that's the result we now have. There's always a lag. There's always a delay between action and effect. We are now suffering the effect of what was done two, three, and four years ago. And I'll show you why. Let's go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Good. On the right, you'll see the average oil price before 2008 was $51. And we were doing okay, not brilliantly, but we were doing okay. We were pretty stable. We weren't growing brilliantly, but we were steady. And then the oil price suddenly shot up, which is the period you see, went as high as $120 a barrel. What did we do with that extra money? Maybe I should ask, what could we have done with that extra money? Well, if we had just fixed power, nothing else, just power, wouldn't be in recession today. If we had just fixed roads, wouldn't be in recession today. If we had just built a rail system, we won't be in recession today. But what did government spend money on during that period? We weren't in government, by the way, but Governor Obi may know some of the people who were there. Ninety percent, ninety percent, sorry, sir. Ninety percent of government expenditure was on what we call recurrent. What is recurrent? Salaries, travel, training, welfare. Welfare, by the way, is food. Welfare. That's what we were spending money on. Only 10% went on capital. Only 10% of government spending was on capital. Now, what is cap capital? Roads, rail, power, housing, building educational institutions. Only 10% of government expenditure was capital. So that's, oh, I think I should pause as His Excellency arrives. No, I should keep going. Okay. So only 10% of what we were spending was productive. Effectively, we were just wasting money. And I have many statistics that I can use. We were, in 2015, our travel, travel bill, travel was 64 billion naira. Yes. But the amount spent on roads was 19 billion for the whole country, the whole federal government. Now, I was a state commissioner. In one year in Ogun State, we spent more than 20 billion on roads, just in our state. How can the whole federation spend 19 billion and we expect to grow? So, a lot of money was wasted. What else happened to that extra money? Please keep that slide, don't show me, slow the slides, very important. What else happened to that extra money? A lot of it was stolen. When the central bank governor at the time said, money is going missing, he was harassed. When the person who's supposed to collect your money, the banker, tells you that, please, your credits are not entering your bank account, you should take notice. We didn't, because things were still looked okay. Money was going missing. People were selling oil, diverting the proceeds. So when we talk about who's to blame, it's not about politics, but truth is, if we're to be very honest, it's all of us. Everybody. That's the truth. When it comes to blame,
We should always have a mirror. It's all of us. Those of us who heard that money was going missing and did nothing, those of us who heard money was going missing and didn't believe it, we're all to blame. And the consequences are what we are now dealing with. Now we're running after money, and it's so interesting, because now we're trying to recover money, and people are shouting at the government, why are you not recovering? Why didn't you talk when they were stealing? If prevention is better than cure, now we're looking for money everywhere. But people were stealing the money, they carted it away. When we started, um, it's interesting, the question that was asked about uh, money being found. When we started the whistleblower policy, there was so much debate. People said, no, why should you pay somebody 5%? And um, our argument was, what about the person who stole 100%? Why aren't you worried about the person who took 100%? Why are you fixated with the person who's getting 5% for helping you to bring it back? 5% is it's just the cost of getting it back. But that's the money that should have been used for our roads. That's the money that should be used for our rail. Yes, Governor B mentioned the fact that money was borrowed. We didn't do that loan, but we inherited it, and government is a continuum for the airports that are being, that are being fixed now. The runway that was closed in Abuja, we paid Julius Berger up front. We called them, we said, this is your money. Make sure the airport is open on the day it's meant to open. Did it not open? If you spend money on the right things, you get the right results. I said it was interesting, just an interesting analogy. We find how much in, in somebody's flat, convert it into Naira, it's about 24 billion, 24 billion. It was only 8 billion was needed for that runway. We wouldn't have had to have closed the airport. So. We need to be very, very honest with ourselves so that we don't all think it was everybody else, not us. We all sat here. We all watched that excess. There's some countries that just sold their oil forward, like the Mexicans. They sold their oil forward. They said, give us $68 a barrel. We don't care whether it goes to 150, 100. We just want stability. There's some countries where they only set, um, spend a fixed percentage of their oil revenues. But we lived on oil. And it made us feel good. And unfortunately, we didn't spend those, those boom years, we didn't spend the money on the right things. And that's why we are now in a position, as Governor Obi has acknowledged, that we do have to borrow. Why? Because if we have to wait for the oil price to recover, we'll be in recession for a very long time. So the only option we have is borrow, but use the money for capital projects that will grow the economy. Now, how do capital projects grow the economy? And I use this analogy a lot. Take two entrepreneurs. If you take a Nigerian and another entrepreneur, let's assume they both bake cookies. The one in Nigeria there has certain things that make him or her uncompetitive. Number one, power. Number two, okay, after baking the cookies, how do you move them? Let's even say the person is in Onisha. Before they bring their cookies from Onisha to Lagos, the cost of transport has made them unprofitable. And it's cheaper to then import from China the same cookies. So that's what's been happening. But we're trying to change that. And that's why you see the massive expenditure on capital projects. Trying to do more with much less money. Because when we do that, businesses can thrive. When we put the rail system in place and you can move from maybe Ibadan to Lagos in 40 minutes instead of six hours, businesses can thrive. And that's where jobs are created, and that's how economies grow. And those jobs are not in oil. Those jobs are outside oil. Those are resilient jobs that will bring long-term growth to our economy. So that's the story. That's really the story of what happened. We had a lot of money, and we didn't use it well. We squandered it. What wasn't stolen was wasted. And now we're living with the consequence. At that same time, we were borrowing. The same time that oil prices were as high as 120, Nigeria was borrowing. Borrowing to pay salaries. Now we're borrowing to do railway, and people are saying, don't borrow. I don't get it. We have to be serious. We have no choice. When they were borrowing to pay salaries, is when we should have come out and said, why are you borrowing? Oil is 120. What are you borrowing for? And yet you're not doing capital projects. So what are you borrowing for? 
Those are the questions, those are the debates we should have had, but we didn't have them. But the past is gone, but we need to move forward. So how is this government trying to do things differently? Capital expenditure now is our focus. Everything we're doing is to create headroom for capital expenditure that will bring in quality infrastructure that will get this economy moving. There's pretty much no part of this federation that doesn't have the potential to be productive. Now we're talking about ebony rice. Who knew ebony rice then? Now we're, buying, we're eating local rice. We're talking about heavy rice instead of buying Thailand rice. That's creating jobs for Nigerians. And we must continue along those lines. We must get our refineries working so that we don't import uh, petroleum. And we cannot be importing food. We simply can't afford to be importing food. 180 million people with the kind of unemployment we have, we have no business importing food. And we have huge, huge amounts of fertile land. We can't import food. So let me move on to the next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so what are we doing? How are we trying to do things differently? One of the things that we're trying to do is to improve our revenue so that we're not so dependent on oil. Oil is only 10% of our economy, but it was representing about 60% of government revenues. That's a mismatch. What about the rest of the economy? Why is it contributing so little to government revenue? Our tax to GDP ratio in Nigeria is 6%. We have one of the lowest in the world. Ghana is at 15.9% tax to GDP. South Africa's at 24. Most advanced countries are around 30 to 32% tax to GDP. We're at six. I ran um, some analysis. I asked the Federal Indian Revenue Service to give me details of the number of Nigerians paying taxes of 20 million naira or above. Anybody want to guess the number? 214 for the whole country out of 180 million people. And yet we have billionaires, millionaires, trillionaires. How can only 214 people be paying tax of 20 million naira or more? Something's wrong. So we're going to fix that. We have to broaden the tax base. Already the F Federal Indian Revenue Service have, have registered more than 825,000 companies, companies that have either paid no tax at all or who were just registered and, and, and just didn't pay. And they're active, and some of them were doing business with government. So we set a rule. If you come to government for a payment, the first thing we do is check your tax status. That's when we discover that even some people who came, subsidy, government is owing me, is owing me, want to pay you now. You've never paid any tax. How can that be? So we're blocking all those loopholes. If you come to government now, we want to see your tax status. There's a legal requirement on every headed paper, you're supposed to list the names of directors. We've not been complying. We've just sent out a circular. If you're processing a payment, if we can't see the names of the directors of the company, don't pay. Because we must know that everybody pays their fair share. It's the way a tax system, a good tax system must work. And for us to drive this country forward, Nigerians have to pay the right taxes. Not tax of going bring a tax clearance certificate of 50,000 naira and you're traveling business class. That, those days are over. People have to pay the right taxes. If we want services, if we want power, if we want rail, if we want road, we have to pay for it. So we also are blocking leakages um, in the tax system and improving compliance. Then we're improving customs revenue. When we came into office, all the scanners, all the container scanners had broken down. Why? They gave the contract to some politicians to do. They didn't maintain the scanners. Oh, none are working. Now, that has an impact on two things. It has an impact on customs revenue because for them to see what's inside the container, they have to open it and begin to pull it out and look at the things. It's not done like that anywhere in the world. It adds to the mm -hmm. delay in your getting um, your goods out, and it gives customs officers discretion. What is this? Is it a greenhouse or is it a, they, they decide? No, it shouldn't be like that. We're one of the few countries that doesn't have what is called single window. Single window is when you ship a good from one country, you, you key in the detail and the HS codes, and automatically it will affect how much customs duty should be paid without even seeing what's in the container. So we're doing that. We're bringing those and buying new, new container scanners so that we can get the right customs revenues. Because we actually...
actually import a lot of things in this country. And there is a disconnect between how much we import and the customs revenues, which means money is leaking. So we're using technology to block that. Then we're improving tax uh, on luxury items. We believe that the first taxes that should increase are on the people who have the greatest ability to pay. So luxury items, those of you that like champagne and brandy and um, alcohol and tobacco should be ready to pay a higher rate of tax and customs duty on those items. So we'll be rolling those out shortly. This is church, you don't drink champagne now. So, on the cost side, of course, we must reduce corruption. We are fighting the battle against corruption. We are fighting the battle against leakages. We're stopping the situations where money just went missing. There was no accountability for money. We, 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 we're working very, very hard to stop that. We're using technology. We're cleaning out a lot of the ghost workers and uh, fraudulent or dead people that are still collecting pensions. Why? Because 40% of government expenditure is on salaries and pensions. 40%. So 40 out of every 100 naira that government spends on either salary or pension. So you have to control it. You have to control it. We're building the controls. We're using biometric. We're using scanners. We're using every form of technology to keep that wage bill down. Why? Wage bill, when I, came, when I first became minister, was 165 billion naira every month. 165 billion. It's a huge, huge amount. So you have to control it. Now we're bringing it down. Every month we're taking people off the payroll. Some of them have been dead for years. Some people collecting three, four salaries. I'm very optimistic that EFCC will shortly secure our first conviction against one of the ghost workers, those people collecting multiple salaries, because I've insisted that they must be prosecuted. No matter how short the sentence is, it's important to send the message that as far as we're concerned, collecting two or three salaries, collecting salary on behalf of a, uh, your mother that died and continuing to collect her pension is fraud. And we must send that message very, very strongly. Then we're reducing our overheads. Um, Governor Obi spoke a lot about wastage. It's one of our, my fixations as a minister. We cannot afford, we don't have money to waste. So we sent round circulars. You cannot travel in a private jet. You cannot travel first class. You cannot uh, spend more than, I think it's 1,500 naira for lunch. When I came in, some, some meetings, would have, when you calculate how many people were at the meeting and how much they spent on food, it's like 15,000 naira ahead. I said, ah, ah, are they there for the food or are they there for the meeting? No, you can't do this. It's, it's 1,500 naira. Whatever that, that covers, that should be enough. Then we made a lot of new circulars. No um, face cap, T-shirts. Um, then uh, these programs where... The first page is the president, second page is the vice president, third page is... We don't need all that. So we've, we've sent circulars to stop all that. So there's a lot of efficiency being brought into government. Then we also have um, work on our debt profile. Of course, I explained that our debts had increased quite significantly by the time we came into office. And... Government is the biggest borrower. So once government borrows at 16, it creates the baseline and private sector then finds itself borrowing at 23, 24. So what we're trying to do is we have to borrow, but we're trying to borrow as cheaply as possible. So we're approaching the concessional lenders. We're borrowing offshore where possible to leave room for the private sector so that they too can come in and um, borrow to um, fund their business. In the short term, we must borrow because we have no choice. If we want to invest in our infrastructure, we've got to borrow. We don't have the money and we cannot afford to wait for the oil price to recover because the outlook is that it's going to stay between 50 and 51 for at least the next four years. We're not going back to the days of 120 anymore, so we just have to live with the current reality. However, as we improve our revenues, we have a sinking fund set up now to begin to retire debt so that we begin to pay down debt. As things improve, we begin to pay down debt. Um, um, Governor Obi mentioned the issue of saving, and I'm pleased to tell you, sir, that last month, for the first time, we paid money into the excess crude account. $87 million was paid into the excess crude account. So even though things are difficult, we are saving. And the Sovereign Wealth Authority, as you know, sir, since we've come in, we've given them an extra $500 million, and we're still planning to do more. So we've learned the lessons of the past. And we are working towards a more resilient future for everybody. As I 
said, we've increased our allocation to capital within the budget to 30%, up from 10% where we inherited it. And that's why you're seeing work going on. You're seeing projects getting done. And we will continue with that. Yes, there is a lag. People are asking, when is it going to affect me? It affects you when the projects are finished. It affects you when businesses, and it started to happen now, and I'm very happy to say that when I leave here, and that's why I was rushing a little, um, I'm going to meet a group of investors who've come in from America, long-term investors who are now looking at Nigeria and saying, yes, it's time to come. On Thursday, we have a group of, of Japanese investors. We're not talking about people that have brought, bring, um, you know, sachets of tea for us to come and sell. No, we're talking about people that want to set up factories. We're talking about people that want to manufacture transformers. We're talking about industrialists. They're coming back into Nigeria because Nigeria is showing that it's serious. Nigeria has understood its problem. We've taken the pain. We've taken the pain. Often the medicine that does you the best is the most bitter medicine. And we have had very bitter medicine in the last one year. But now we'll have the long-term uh, benefits in terms of growth and in terms of job. Then in the area of entrepreneurship, we have revived uh, the Development Bank of Nigeria, which is a project that was started under our predecessor. It, it had stalled, we got it going. That bank is going to have $1.3 billion of capital that will be lent to microfinances and banks specifically to be on lent to small and medium-sized businesses. Because actually our economy is 50% are SMEs and only 10% of them have access to loans. So if you begin to improve their access to capital, you can rapidly, rapidly grow jobs and grow business. So that's one of the initiatives. The other one is a project called UWIN, uh, which some of you will know. UWIN was a project that gave grants to long, young entrepreneurs. We've reviewed it and revised it. We're changing it into two things. One is enterprise education, teaching people how to do business. A lot of people will say, I know how to do business. I was born in business, no. If you go anywhere in the world where business thrives, take America, they have magazines on business, books on business, television programs on business. So it's not innate. You have to learn it, you have to work on it. So we're improving entrepreneurial education. How do you write a business plan? How do you work out whether you're making profit or not? Some people are just doing business. They're, they're making losses, they don't even know. So we need to improve our knowledge of business as well as bringing in the funding. And then on the funding front, we're, we're putting, we've put together a venture fund. So those who come to us, small businesses that need up to 50 million of capital, will be able to approach the UWIN venture fund. Then we take a stake in their business. As the business grows, they can either buy us out, or they can list, or they can look for um, new investment. So that's the plan. And of course, as a venture fund, we will incubate those businesses, so provide them with all the support for them to grow. The, so, we're also looking at providing additional incentives to investors that want to invest in small businesses by giving them tax relief. So encouraging rich people, richer or wealthier people, to invest in growing businesses and allow them some tax relief to do so. Of course, all this is um, um, the financial side, but it's being supported by the work that the Minister of Trade and Industry and Investment is doing on ease of doing business, removing some of those bottlenecks that cause uh, uh, four or five different agencies to come and harass people. We're, we're, we're harmonizing all those things, multiple taxation, to improve our ease of doing business, because that's also a very important factor in growth. So, what do we tr expect to happen? You can see what happened in 2015, that even though tax was only 10% of our GDP, it was 62% of our revenues. That's what made us vulnerable. So as soon as the oil price fell, we were in trouble. And let me give you a, 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 an idea that in, in 2013, I believe it was, the fact, that's the monthly sharing that Governor Obi doesn't like, that sharing, it was 900 billion for one month. And this month, which is, the, in fact, when I, as I've been minister, we sat down one month, it was only 300. So you, you can imagine if your income drops from 900 to 300, there's no way you will not have an impact. Now it's getting back up gradually. I think last month was 460. So there's still a long way to go from where we were. The question we should really ask ourselves is, what projects were done when that money was sold? What happened to that money? That's the, that's the, that's the billion dollar question that we're all asking. Which roads were built? Which airports were finished? Which power improved? Nothing. There's nothing to show for that money. But we can't afford to let that happen again. The past is gone. But now everybody's eyes are watching closely, and I think it, it, it's a good thing. So the plan is to improve 
um, um, oil and non-oil taxes to, imp to, to get the balance right. So the rest of the economy, agriculture, services, banking, trade, people must pay taxes. There must be more revenue to show for those areas. of We can't all rely on oil. So we're going to be pushing out quite a few initiatives to improve our revenue. Then on our costs, we'll continue to be efficient, continue to be prudent, continue to make sure that every Naira counts. That's one of our mantras in the Ministry of Finance.